Hey folks, how are you doing? Nice to have all of you here again. Another player too. And this time, for you that are not really used to, it's time to talk about the backstage of making new games, right? Making games is something really hard, but also something that people love. People who do the games, they love to do it. So, what I have here to you today, I have a new game that is not released yet, so we, we're going to have the chance to see it uh, in a, I would say, kind of first hand with one of the main developers, and that's going to be amazing. Uh, I hope you enjoy. So let me bring the develop here, so so then you can know Mark. So Mark, Mark Venturelli, are you there, my friend? I am. Hello. I am. Hello. How's it, going? How's it going? Hey, how are you doing? So, Mark, can you give us a little of your a little bit of your background? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so, sure. Um, so, um, I was making games, was making for, games for about, about 12, years now. 12 years now. 12 uh, years. Mailing, uh, mailing is, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, since, 2000, since 2008. Eight. Um, um, I've, I've been, been mostly a game mostly designer, game throughout, designer my career. throughout my career. Uh, I've created uh, a studio I've before. Studio before. Um, uh, studio. Pretty studio. In Rio. In I would Rio. make a game called Dungeon, Dungeon, Dungeon Land. After that, I became just a game designer again. Um, I worked on a game called Chroma Squad. Uh, and then I made a little game with my friend Batu called Relic Country Zero. And um, just a, a free game that we released five years ago. No expectations. And I just blew up. I got millions of players around the world. Uh, built up a community of uh, devoted fans. And now we are rogues now. So uh, I'm the CEO of the studio. We've been working on the Relic Hunters universe as our flagship IP. And Relic Hunters Legends is our flagship title for that IP. Uh, we're about 17 people now. And um, we're growing. Like uh, we are aggressively recruiting this year. Uh, we might get to about 30 people by the end of the year. So it's a lot of people. And you are, you are coordinating them, right? Yeah. So uh, I'm still uh, the main designer on the game, uh, even though we have more designers now working, uh, creating stuff for, for Roller Country's Legend. But um, yeah, my my most of my day now it's on a leadership role. So it's pretty much how is your day by day on dealing with the new development of a game? How that works? So uh, it varies a lot. Uh, I think that's probably the, the reply you get from a lot of developers here uh, when you ask them that question. Uh, but I think for me especially, really, it really varies a lot, my day by day. Um, so for example, if um, right now it's mostly about recruiting uh, and thinking about like long-term stuff. So um, right now I'm really focused on the team rather than the products. Um, like, hiring key people to key positions, making sure that everybody's performing well, making sure that everybody's happy, um, getting like the, the boring stuff out of the way so that people can um, just work in the game carefree and just focus on working on the game. And, and focus on the game, right? Because there are different kinds, uh, how can I say, of talents, right? There is like graphic talents, there is coding talents, and how to manage those guys with different needs, right? That should be something that you have to understand very well how everything works, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I think this is something that we actively look for in everybody we hire rogues now, ideally, is that people in game dev uh, should definitely be like T-shaped professionals. Like uh, you have like a broad um, knowledge of pretty much every single aspect of game development but you're like a deep uh, specialist in, in one subject. That's the T concept, right? Someone yeah. that can know a little bit of everything, but has a deep knowledge in one area. So that's why exactly. we call it the T concept. That's really, really interesting because games are very different than any other kind of software development because there is the storytelling part. There is the, the more human part of that, that in many other kind of develop, developments is not that important. You can may stop at the user interface only, like click here, go there, and that's it. That, that's all. But you have the storytelling part that has to be part and integrate with everything, right? So I guess that's the most challenging thing for a game developer that is coordinating a huge team like yours. 
Oh yeah, for sure. I, I wouldn't call my team a, a huge team, maybe for Brazilian indie uh, scale, for sure. Uh, but yeah, it's actually a pretty small team, especially for a game of the scale that we're making, where what you're saying is actually very, very true. Uh, especially like the Royal Avengers Legend has so many moving parts, because um, it's kind of, we joke around inside the studio that Relic Hunters Legend is kind of that rookie uh, first game that game developers, uh, junior game developers think they're going to make. Like, <laughs> oh, we're going to make online games, it's going to be an RPG, it's going to have features from all of these like AAA titles and stuff like that. Um, it, it's kind of a crazy game. Um, it's a mini MMO. It's inspired by games like Borderlands and that's okay. even more fun. So let's check the game. Yeah, yeah. Right Let's check it. how it looks like. Okay. So what do I have here? I'm in a classroom, right? Yeah, so uh, this is the very beginning of the story. You're waking up in this classroom. You don't know who you are and why you're there. So I have here the teacher, right? So he's asking me because I did some, I start a little and I quite fast like get to this point. There's a lot of setup actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's okay. a lot of lore and a lot of story to this game. Uh, hopefully the story has uh, some mysteries in place for people. Uh, this okay. is something that we put a lot of love and care into. There's so, clearly, you can see like a JRPG kind of yeah, inspiration. It, it's purely storytelling right now. So there's my character mm -hmm. over there, probably. Or my character is around, I don't know yet which is my character. And it's yeah, sleeping right in the classroom, right? So the storytelling Which is, is happening. Which is a JRPG staple. Yeah, yes. Your character wakes up. <laughs> <laughs> the Definitely. Just like everything. And it's cool because you guys are not using real voices. You are using uh, this kind of strategy, this kind of approach, right? Yeah, we do a mix. Yes, yeah, so mix. you put some voices, but they are not really the... Yeah, some scenes are... Language-wise. Okay. You avoid language approach, right? So yeah, it's universal. Like, um, yeah, yeah. Like some key scenes, uh, we have them fully voiced. Uh, but most of the game, we do uh, just these. We call them voice snippets or voice quips. Uh, they just, they just uh, sell a little bit of the emotion on under different lines and the, the voice and personality of the characters. But they don't really, don't really read the lines. That's cool. Um, that's one of the many, many um, decisions that we made in this game to make it feasible for uh, a team as well as ours um, for example, we have full voice everywhere. It's not a, it's not a matter of, of, of voice actors being expensive. Um, they really they really aren't that expensive. Um, mm -hmm. It's something that if you have like a, a good budget, it's not going to hurt you too much. The main problem is that the pressure that it puts on the production, right? Because you need to have your designers empowered and making quick stuff and making uh, a lot of contents. And uh, they they need to lock down text very er a lot earlier and they cannot iterate anymore after you have recorded voice, right? Right. So that's why we limit to just only a, a key, a few key scenes. It's, it just makes it a lot easier for us to add a lot of content faster. And you're gonna see that this is something that it's I'm gonna say that a lot. <laughs> if we do, if we're talking about, <laughs> if we're talking about production and how we approach the development of this game, you're gonna hear me saying a lot of, we made this decision because it is gonna allow us to make content quickly. That's the key to everything we do, really. And it's something that also it's be become some somehow become like kind of personality, right? Like this belongs to the idea of the game. If you have this approach, so this will follow along the game. We're gonna take advantage of that and find the nice sounds that match this intention, right? Yeah, for and, sure. And, and that's for everything else. So now I'm I'm walking around and I'm exploring, right? Mm -hmm. And it's it's a PC game right now. You guys yes. can guess that. And I have to press X and hold to check stuff around. So there's different kind of things on the on the scene right now that I'm checking around. And I can walk just like in a FPS, which is nice. It's a very common uh, understanding of how to walk around, but I still can use the mouse. Let me open the door. Exit the classroom. Yes, let's do it. You can give me some tips. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then like, a, 
I have teleported from there. That's cool. And even the teacher got like kind of amused. So again, like the the story is developing, right? Yeah, I mean, there's quite a bit of mysteries involved, uh, and we try we try to start out the the game with enough quirky and weird scenes to get the player hooked. Right? Whoa! Like what? Like what is going on? And um, I think this is a really strong way to start a story to make people care. You just surprise them with like weird stuff. And I assure you that everything makes sense. <laughs> it's, uh, it's just a matter of time. Just, yeah, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna start to unravel uh, these mysteries over time. It's really cool though. Like now, I teleported to a place. Uh, there mm. is a num I guess it's a number zero seven. Yes. A kind of hexagon or double pyramid. Um, black one, very mysterious. And I have to walk. It's like walking like Tom John or. Kind of game map <laughs> reminds me a little bit, which is cool. That's an uh, old school reference. Yeah, right there. <laughs> it's very similar in terms of how the map is close to the character and the things around. Yeah, there's actually a lot of interesting tricks going on with that game perspective right there. Like, uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, different. I, f I feel like it's a quite a unique mix of 2D and 3D. We have a lot of 2D elements uh, You're right. along the, the 3D ones. Okay, I'm I just now in the desert and I don't see where else I can go. Oh, I can hold shift <laughs> to sprint. Yeah, hold shift oh, to space bar. That's something, that's something cool. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so then they can climb stuff. Yeah. That's cool. And then I found Can't something climb. else. Gadget. That's cool. Okay. Now you have your heads up. To so school. now I can have more information about myself, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now I have my HP or life or both, I guess, and something else over there that I cannot recognize what it is. Looks like a chicken. <laughs> it's a guy. Yeah, it's not a chicken. Yeah, it's a potion. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah. It's real it it's it's works. really cool because is this now, kind now that you say I cannot unsee the chicken. Yeah, that's <laughs> uh, that, that's maybe that's a good feedback for you, right? Like you can test. But mm -hmm. I'm seeing a chicken over there, but you are the, the main <laughs> developer. But one thing that I like as well, again, is the graphic approach because the the menu over there um it's it's a kind of gumball graphic like it's different mm -hmm. than the graphics itself on the game. I like that. It's kind of cartoonish, distinguish on yeah, what is on the, the HUD, what is on the game, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really needs to pop. Like uh, our main artist, Betu, is really talented and he, um, he really understands something that I also think it's extremely important in every single game, which is you need to have like a very clear contrast between like gameplay elements, environments, interface like uh the characters they need to pop up from the background and the interface has to pop up from everything else which is harder than it sounds actually it, it takes a lot imagine. of planning and it takes solid art direction which i think we do have in this game i can imagine by the lines itself the line of the character and and how the shadows react to the character mm -hmm. this is this is some techniques to make the character pop up right yeah like the it's shadows, really cool. they are they not only look good, uh, I think they're pretty cool, but they, they serve a really important purpose in making the 2D objects blend into the 3D environments. Yeah, right. Now I'm I'm facing that pretty much. Because the graphics are pretty much like 2D, but mm -hmm. but the whole scenario is built on 3D models. And exactly. to, to give this sense of depth. He used the shadows for that, and it works really well. Yeah. I can see right here. So if, if you didn't mention, to me, in my mind, was working fine and smooth. Now that mm -hmm. you mentioned, I can kind of, oh, OK, so that's a technique to make it easier to recognize. Otherwise, everything exactly. should be like very 2D, just one plane. But with the shadows, you can distinguish the depth of everything, how tall exactly. they are, um, how far they are, these kind of things. Exactly, cool. it really helps out. There's a lot of stuff in the art direction as well. For example, um, you can see that um, 
the really tall walls over there, they're really dark, and they get darker as they get uh, closer to the bottom. This is something that we actually have a shader for that. So the texture is just a small texture. We don't have we don't have the entire gradients going from uh, light to dark. We just have a shader that if uh, the texture is going down from like a, a, a Y position, it gets darker. So this helps players like give a, a better sense of depth. Got it, like this, right? I'm seeing right now like a an area like this. That's what you mentioned? Uh, so there's a little bit of delay, but I assume that yeah. uh, if you're pointing the area right under the gun, um, that's also a little bit of screen space ambient occlusion. Okay. So that little dark uh, darkening uh, below that also really helps sell the volume and the depth of the, of the scene. Uh, it's actually SSAO. It's uh, screen space ambient occlusion. Um, we also do, you, you might have noticed little bits of wind and dust floating around. They also help sell depth of the scene and make Very it feel true. like uh, alive. So there's Very a lot true. of little details like this that make it really come alive. It's not only just put the characters in there and it's working. Like it, it, There's a lot of um, iteration and a lot of um, thought that went behind every single art decision in this game. And I guess some decisions that are quite easy to do, everybody kind of agree on the direction. And some decisions are mm -hmm. quite hard and people dispute, right? What should be the right direction, the right mm -hmm. thing to do, something like this. I guess this is very common for you. Do you have an example like this, something that was really like a snap, everybody said, yes, this is the direction, and something that was really a struggle, and then suddenly you have to decide to go in one direction, otherwise you never move on on the project. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't think that second thing happens with Rogue, um, but that's just how we work, and I think it's a level of maturity of the teams. Um, I've worked with a lot of different teams over the years, and I've coached um, younger teams for starting out. And um, what I usually see is that younger teams, they usually have less confidence uh, on each other. So they argue more, they dispute more, they trust less on each other's opinions. Um, and they tend to overvalue some uh, issues over um, things that should just be decided and moved on from. Uh, so I think Rogue's Nails are very... We don't really have disputes. Uh, I, don't, I, I cannot think of an example where I had to step in and say, guys, like we need to do this. Everybody shut up. <laughs> Let's just move on. Um, <laughs> But yeah, there's there's definitely a lot of stuff that was not um, was not easy for us to figure out what to do. Uh, I'll give you a very clear example. So uh, on the example of uh, stuff that was easy to for everybody to agree was, for example, SSAO that I just mentioned, screen space ambient occlusion. Like um, we were having still like trouble selling the depth and trying to. Oh, you're getting combat right now. Yeah, no, I'm waiting you explain. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's going to be intense right now. It's going to be intense. <laughs> I can feel it. Yeah, the, the, the little guy is shaking, man. <laughs> he, he doesn't sound happy. Yeah, he's not at all. I can see. But yeah, it's, it's screen space and occlusion is something that when we put it in, everybody was like, yeah, this is definitely the best approach for the game. Let's just do it. Uh, let's put it in everywhere. It's were um, the little assets there, like uh, trees and cactus. Our main set is like, let's make a candy because it's for the we got a little bit. You are breaking a little bit. Wait, wait. You are breaking a little bit. Let's see if it's come back. Steps. Okay, it's come back. Wow. Skype, Skype, Skype. Just help us to come back. <laughs> oh my God! I'm gonna have to explain this part again because it was breaking. But let me kill the alien first because I pressed the button by accident. Okay, he's dead. So now we can explain again. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was a breaking on Skype. Your voice was breaking when you were explaining the, the situation.
Hello? Cacti? Can you can you see Cacti over there? Yeah, now, now so, I can see you. Used to be, uh, uh, hear me. You are breaking really badly. Oh, that's bad. Let me see if I can can have you back here. Yeah, I can see on the stream. See on the stream. I'm, I'm watching, watching the stream. stream. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I'm really, really kicking. It's five. Five. Do you, you want to? Do you want me to? to no, no, it's fine. Uh, hang up and call it's fine. you again. It's fine. It's fine. I think we should. We we could show the game really well. We approach already 32 minutes of the stream. So now on this screen, you can explain. I think it's better to explain. So explain yeah, sure. this decision um, over I this approach, really, right? Really clearly now, so I guess it's better. Yeah, can it's you better. Hear me okay, it's better, way better. Awesome. Uh, so yeah, the the cacti, for example, um, they used to be two D uh, because we have this philosophy of if we can do something in two D, let's do it. Uh, it's just much cheaper from a production standpoint. Um, but then we quickly realized that um, it just wasn't working. So it really took a long time for us to to come to this decision and also myself as the producer because I knew just how much more expensive it would be to create every single asset in 3D. But uh, it ended up working just fine. Uh, it was not that much more work for these small assets and um, this is something that I think just made the game a lot better over. I think I think I think it did. I can feel the game is really well done at this stage. Thanks. So le let's go back to the game. Okay, so now I'm back into the game. Here I am. Now Ooh, I kill some coming. Yeah, I dogs. kill an alien, a red berry alien. It looks <laughs> like a berry a little bit, but it was really, really annoying guy. Very fast. <laughs> yeah, they're called Kami. Kambi. Yes, they've been on the Rally Country okay. series. Since and it's the first cool because, like, again, like, now there is a soundtrack. Before, mm -hmm. there is no soundtrack. It's kind of silent on the game. So, you wait until the moment of the first encounter with an enemy yeah. to bring the soundtrack to the game, to create this moment of excitement, right? Exactly. Like, um,. There's nothing stronger and more effective at creating emotion than music, right? If you're trying to create any kind of emotion, uh, whether it's uh, on a video game or a movie or whatever you're doing, uh, if it's an audio visual media, of course, <laughs> yeah, uh, some... music is going to be yeah. music is going to be the strongest, like a blunt instrument that you can. Hey, here, this is how you should feel right now, you know. It's, yeah, um, like like gives the motion tone exactly to the exactly. moment. Yeah, it, like, it it literally tells the player how they should be reacting to a scene. Like if you play a scene uh, and then you play the same scene with a sad uh, or an ominous music, it's completely different. You read that differently. And if you play the same scene with a comedy kind of of song. That's a, uh, the same scene now becomes completely different, like the emotion of it and the the subtext. So uh, yeah, we do we do have one, in my opinion, just one of the greatest composers and sound designers on the Brazilian industry, uh, Rafael Miller. I've been working with this guy. Oh, I, I'd for love to bring years. him here. He's amazing. He's really good. I'd love um, to bring him here. He's really really good uh, and a great great guy as well. And, um, oh no, they are he... trying to get me. <laughs> Shit! <You can> <laughs> too many, too it. many! Oh my god, those you guys like blood. <laughs> you can do it, we believe in you. Uh, <laughs> you, can you, hold, you can hold right mouse button uh, to use oh, the laser Oh, it's like a side. laser, that's a yeah, good tip. It's gonna help you a little bit. Oh, that's good. That's good. But yeah, we use a lot of music to sell emotion, especially because we have kind of a minimalist approach to story scenes, right? We don't have like fully uh, motion capture cut scenes or anything like that. We have the simple no! movement and emotion. Come on, there is... on the characters. Oh my god! And, uh, the music really helps sell the emotions that we what need happened? to. What happened? Oh, you <laughs> fell down. <laughs> really sell the emotions. No, you all fell down. It's just great. It's like falling. Uh, is that, is that a glitch? Is that a bug? bug? Yeah, yeah, that's a little that's bug. That's cool. 
Uh, you can hold X, you're gonna come back. Yeah, there you go. I did it. Like, yeah, that's... that's well, a, that's an open bug right now. If you fall down, um, if you die by falling down, uh, you just keep falling down over and over again. <laughs> we gotta work on that. Well, it's okay it's because it's still in development, so that's fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is it just what was good. unexpected for me and easy to fall yeah. because I didn't realize I could fall. Actually, this is something that is a surprise for me in the game right now, and that's cool. Mm -hmm. That's cool to figure out, like learning, you know, learning by doing. Yeah, um, as a designer. I worry a lot about giving people space to um, what uh, Zimmerman and Salen said is time to learn and time to play. Uh, it's a really interesting concept in which you kind of provide safe spaces for the player early on to experiment and make mistakes in a safe environment, pretty much like a child. Mm -hmm. uh, you just uh, went through like a you're going to come into like our first fully voiced cutscene now. Yes, I noticed. I just let that well, play out. So now they can talk. So now they really yeah, talk. Like, like I, I can see a, the, the full talking scene, right? Yeah, yeah, fully voiced. Uh, we have great actors. Some of these actors have been working with me since my first game, since Dungeon Land. So this one is Edwin Tiong. He's really talented guy from New Zealand. He's super funny. Uh, he this really voice helps. is really cool. Uh, he, he has a very unique hey voice. Uh, you probably, people probably know him from Detective Grimoire. Mm. Like uh, he he's, he plays here. a lot of, there's a lot of games uh, where he plays Detective Grimoire. And um, especially I think the, the last one, Tango Tower, is a really awesome like game. Uh, Edwin is just a great guy. Not only he's a, an amazing voice actor, he also likes is a really talented writer. He really helps us flesh out dialogue. Uh, he always brings a little something on uh, everything that we give him. Cool, because like this this uh, character, like, this new character here is quite funny. I can see by the way, but just by the position he's stuck on the tree, <laughs> seems really really funny, and the voice matches the intention, right? Yeah, yeah, like the, this is a very intentional tone shift. Uh, so, so far you've had like mystery and then you have like action and now we're giving you a little uh, a lighthearted moments. Uh, so we present you a, a funny character in a funny situation. Um, so uh, we think that these kinds of tone shifts early on in stories, they really help hook the audience and really help you prevents you from falling into like a predictable uh, rhythm too early on the story. It just uh, grabs your attention a lot more. It's uh, cool because he's given you a test, right? Find my jetpack. Exactly. But actually, exactly. no, wait. <laughs> it's like it's like a conversation is developing in a way very naturally, right? Although I don't have control where to go right now, but I'm pushing the button to go to the next line, next line, next line. Mm -hmm. So I control the, the rhythm. Exactly. So that's also the JRPG influence there, like uh, the way that the dialogue plays out on it when you advance it. Okay, so now I can play and figure out what is this thing. Hmm, probably inside the cave. That's for sure. There you go. Makes a lot of sense. So you can notice one of the things that I really liked about this cave is that um, I don't know if it's going to be noticeable on YouTube, but definitely noticeable for you with your headphones. We have completely the changed the ambience. Yes, yes. Completely changed the ambience. Now there's reverb. There's like a just the audio creates the sensation that you're on a, a new environment. Yes, yeah, so like. Like, I can feel the headphones right now, and it's mm -hmm. quite obvious to me what is happening. It's like, I, I can feel that the the kind of noise that fulfill my ears is completely mm -hmm. different than before. It's like, it's like being inside a box. Exactly. Because I'm inside yeah. a cave, so it's like being inside a closed area. So the sound changes, the kind of sound changes. Yeah. Like, like I said, we have a really talented sound designer, uh, Ref Miller, and um, we also use FMOD, uh, so we're using FMOD for uh, all of our audio, 
And there's really interesting tools that we can use, uh, such as Dynamic River, which is what you get right now. Like, uh, we have different snapshots that we can uh, we can use different mixes depending on the situation. If there are more enemies, uh, we use a mix. If there are less enemies, we use a different mix. Uh, and we can also use cool effects like this to re to help sell the the environments and help ground the the characters. Another thing that I'm enjoying a lot is like the comments. The comments on the game is really easy to set, mm -hmm. and it's really easy to understand the logic. How to play, how to to do stuff. Um, I still feeling that I can do stuff. It's not that hard yet, you know. Mm -hmm. But I also have the feeling that very soon these things will get really complicated. Oh yeah. Like oh, yeah. like now it's just like a little bit of it's about to come, and I'm. It's great anticipation. Anticipation is very very important. For sure. Uh, and like I said, we just try. Like uh, today, I'm really convinced that um, there's no reason for us to not make the game as accessible as possible. Because um, if you're a veteran hardcore gamer, uh, the early stages of any game are gonna be easy for you uh, anyway. Okay. So uh, I don't really see much of a, a point for us to try and challenge people right off the bat. Uh, this is not like Sekiro. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're not really trying to challenge you. We're just trying to uh, show your world and have you have a good time. And we're trying to... Wait, wait, you, you are breaking a little, right? Uh, you're back. Uh, you can fall down the holes, come back. Um, now we are back. By the way, I think I had an emergency sandwich myself. You can take a bite if you want. A small one. Small bite. So if the enemies are aggressive, they're leaping towards you. If you, there are holes that you can fall down, if you are alive, if you take a lot of damage from the heads, all of these things they are creating tension, right? They're creating the the, the emotion of risk, right? The, the emotion that you are in danger. Um, but we are not actually challenging you. You can really fail. Uh, if you die, you just come back. Like uh, of course, me telling you this um, is probably making you. Uh, less uh tense on the on the combat situations but for new especially for newer players uh this really sells the the vibe of it and this this conversation about tension versus actual difficulty is something that um uh, i think i really um brought into my toolkit as a designer on trauma squad so there's a lot of stuff that we do in trauma squad to create tension without creating difficulty and uh, i'm glad we're trying to do the same thing I got your point. You know, like, I enjoy the game, and there's so many details. As more as you play, you notice. Like, I notice now the shells, the bullet shells falling in the ground. Mm -hmm. I didn't notice right in the beginning, but now, because I did a lot, mm -hmm. I saw them kicking in the ground. It's mm -hmm. such nice touches, you know? And, and they and they have object occlusion on the whole scenery, so the whole environment, it reacts. It's like you mentioned, like, the, the 2D is so well blend to the 3D. That you kind of lose the notion what is real 3D, what is real 2D, and this is cool. Yeah. This is really cool because it's like having f real full animation in front of you while you're playing. Yeah, it's it was a lot of work, <laughs> <laughs> uh, especially the character. Uh, if you can notice, like the character, he's not 2D and he's not 3D. He's both. So um, the body of the character, the head, stuff like that, it's 2D. Uh, the weapon is fully 3D. The cape is 3D. Uh, the arms are uh, a dynamic, procedurally generated uh, mesh with inverse kinematics. Um, and we just put everything together. Um, and the illusion that sells everything as like a unity, as like a, a single character, is actually a shader that we developed. We call it Z Flattener. Um, it takes the 3D objects, like the, the gun and the cape and stuff like that, and the arms, and flattens uh, then the, the Z depth on the scene. So they become like sprites. It's almost like you're... They are a 3D a object, but you you just make them in one dimension, exactly. basically, right? Two dimensions, yes. We're flattening Z, yeah, two dimensions. and you only add X and Y. And um, 
what happens then is that you get the, the, the results as if you were doing render to texture, right? It's like you're rendering something to, uh, to uh, a TV screen on the game, stuff like that. You do render to texture. Usually you have to render it again. Uh, it's like a second camera. There's a rendering in the 3D world and that's very expensive. So that's why we created the shader. It's, so it's an, again, like you mentioned from the beginning, right? It's a way to make it faster and cheaper, right? At the same yes. time, at the same time, you make it cool. Exactly, it becomes, it becomes like, a language um, for the game. Exactly, exactly. Like you've never seen a character like this in any other game. It's a signature style that we that we have. So this was also important to us. So that that was a very expensive feature to make, uh, but we think it was worth it because in the end we got like a, a more personality, like a key signature style for the game. And also, uh, just gonna make our lives way easier moving forward. So if we're making like enemies and monsters, die, and die, die your games. suckers! <laughs> <laughs> I'm starting to hate them. <laughs> it's working. There you yes. Go. No, that's, that's cool. Fancy. Like, yeah. like you know, another <laughs> thing I noticed playing here, uh, something that I talked to ships in the last last time about the started on wheels. Uh, in the last player two, you can watch on the the card hard he right here. If you're watching later, you can see. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're talking about the fun in first place, right? Mm -hmm. So, so fun should be present uh, in the very beginning, the very early stages of the game. Otherwise, there is no motivation to keep going. And fun, not as funny, but fun as how we engage with the game from the very early stage. Mm -hmm. And it, you guys, you get it. You extract that from me right away. I start to hate the little things, the real rad yeah. things, those aliens. Yeah, for me, for me, there is. Um, I use like a narrower tool to define that which you just said, which is uh, the toy, right? Mm -hmm. So for for me, uh, there's the game uh, in terms of the, like the formal systems that you're gonna engage in and make decisions. Uh, hopefully, they're meaningful decisions. I'm gonna let you get the little buzz and trigger. Jeez. He so, looks worse than he actually is, it's pretty easy. Yeah. He looks like a fungus. <laughs> but this guy is a it's... pretty bad boy, I can tell. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I like the burp. <laughs> uh, is okay over there? there you go. But yeah, like um I like to think of of games as video games. Uh, as also really needing to have a, a toy aspect to them, as well as being a, a, a formal game system. But uh, which is so, a some companies just, like, they do that. Too... Some, sorry, yeah, sorry to interrupt you. But some companies they do that with intention in mind, right? Like they want to do merchandise later. But I think that's not oh, the yeah, case yeah, yeah. here, right? But that's not that's not what I'm talking about, though. Yeah. It's like um, because when you have a game. Uh, it's usually described in like a, a, a system, right? It's a system that have like discrete states and you make decisions to change these states, stuff like that. Um, so you're deciding, should I move here? Should I shoot there? Uh, am I going to reload my weapon? Am I going to jump? Stuff like that. Um, so this system could be presented awesome. in a completely dull way, right? Uh, sure, you could interact with this, like even if it's real time, not turn based. You could just see like a little square on the screen and it just instantly teleports to positions with no uh, interpolation. Uh, everything represented by like simple geometric shapes and no juice and no toy, right? Video sure. games, uh, especially, I, I think all video games, um, they, they have uh, an aspect of them that is the toy. And the difference for me between the toy and the game is that the toy is something that you play with with no goals and no boundaries, you just you just fucking around, you know. It's mm -hmm. like uh, you get something. For example, I get a lot of. I have this medicine uh, case here that sits on my desk all day, and uh, I just like the way that it feels to open it up and close it down. It makes a little noise, click, right? And uh, so this is something that I play around with. Like I'm talking to you, and I'm opening and closing this because it feels good. This the feeling, toy, the right? noise, the, exactly. the the mechanics. Exactly, and this is something that we as humans uh, were, were really fascinated with. Like, uh, it's these little feedbacks and these little toy aspects of just playing around and stuff. And usually, when I design all of my games, I I tend to start with the toy. So I tend to make it feel good first, 
to just fuck around. And then I start to worry about the formal game systems. Cool. That's a cool approach. Okay, so now I have ah, the jetpack. Sweet jetpack. Well, I love oh, the I voice of this you. guy. <laughs> it's a really nice voice, though. Edwin is awesome. All, all of our voice actors are you. really amazing. I'm a fan. Like, we have so much talent. Like, Edwin T. Young. We have Elspeth oh, Eastman. Okay. We have uh, Josh Tomar. Kim Lin Tran. Nice. Nice Lucian Dodge. You. Like, there's so many talented people. Um, and I'm really proud of what we're pulling yeah, out in terms of like story and the scenes and everything with the characters. Gosh, I finished the first level. The first level. <laughs> yeah, that's we, really we took cool. Our sweet time. <laughs> no, that's really really cool. Like I really enjoy it. And you have also the probably you have also the the mood player right now. There's a map. I, Cool. So yeah, I can select different so there's, areas. Yeah, there's a second story mission, like a there's a prologue slash tutorial before we let you into the multiplayer. So uh, there's this um, a legend is born uh, is going to be your second story mission before we actually let you in multiplayer. Okay, so then on the multiplayer, uh, I can play with others. Yes. Uh, but wh what is the dynamics? How it looks like on the multiplayer? Um, so there's a town hub, so you can see it in the map there, it's called the Secret Market. Uh, you got to meet other people there like an MMO. Uh, we still don't know how many we're going to let in each shard of the town, uh, as many as possible. Right now we're aiming to something like uh, between 16 and 64. Uh, we need to test uh, how many people we can cram in there. We've made tests with the whole studio, like 17 people, on a happy hour. We we usually have, like, the, this is a tangent, but I think it's a pretty fun one. Uh, so we're a fully remote studio, we always have been. Uh, Rogue's Nail has been remote since 2014. Uh, this is on our DNA. Um, and now in these trying times, everybody's going remote, and people are doing stuff that for us is normal. Uh, and one of these things is uh, online happy hours. So uh, we hang we on hang, uh, like a uh, video, uh, video call, everybody on the same video call, uh, and we just like, like everybody orders, everybody orders food, and drinks, food and drinks, and, drinks, and we just slap the slap games, games together, stuff, together like stuff like that. And, um, and uh, we, we, we did that we did inside, that inside of the game City Hub, City Hub recently, like we put like 17, like 17 people there, there. Uh, just to uh, test the, 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 the working system, system, but also to just like screw around, like screw around, stuff like that. Uh, so the social aspect is something that we really try to, uh, to other countries to make people want to hang out in the game and talk and be friends to people and stuff like that. There's a lot of systems that we're designing to encourage these kind of stuff. And then there's the missions, right? So there's multiple missions. Uh, you can match make stuff like that uh, with up to four people. Uh, it scales you can play by yourself. Uh, if you're playing with more people, it gets a little bit harder to compensate. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of game modes, like there's, there's run and gun, you, there's defending the point, there's payload, um, survival, and stuff like that, like your usual multiplayer kind of affair. That's really cool. Mark, I really enjoyed the game. I didn't expect the game to be so cool as it is right now. I don't know, for how long are you guys working oh, on, this, on this game? We have been working on this game since uh, mid 2017, so that's uh, almost three years now. Now we started with pretty much just me, <laughs> and uh, in in uh, 2017, um, the team grew um, as the years went by. We had a Kickstarter campaign in October 2017. We we're very fortunate to have uh, some Kickstarter backers support us uh, and and allow us to increase the team size. Uh, in 2018. Uh, just kept working on the game, making it bigger. Uh, we got an investor in 2018, like some uh, group from Korea that thought our game was pretty cool. Uh, they helped us out to to help fund the game and get to where we are right now. And uh, and now we have, and this is something like is very very recent. Uh, we're signing the game with a AAA publisher. Uh, we can't really talk about which publisher it is. People are gonna find out when they announce it. Um, but it's something that is really also transforming the scope and scale of what we do. But the, the game, game sure. the game is really cool. I like the graphics. I like the gameplay. I just played for some minutes, just the first stage, first level. 
and I can tell like I could play for another two hours easily trying to progress myself in the game and see where the story leads me so the storytelling from the beginning is quite amazing can keep me can hook me and take me to the next level I love the way you guys did it really good job really good job love thank the you. game thank you so mark how people can find you how people can find the game when it's available so where it's gonna be available tell everyone so uh, you can find me uh, mostly at twitter at mark venturelli mark with a k uh, right m-a-r-k yeah. venturelli just how just how is this spelled on the video okay. title there at mark venturelli on twitter uh, you can find the game on Twitter as well and pretty much every other social media. Just look for Relic Hunters Universe. Um, Relic Hunters Universe, it's because we actually have free games already. Uh, that's a similar situation with Starlet, right? Starlet that you yes. had here, you're doing it, the IP thing, we're also doing it. So we have Relic Hunters Zero, Relic Hunters Rebels, and now Relic Hunters Legend. Um, so you can find the game in pretty much every social uh, media. But if you want to know, um, like Steam page, stuff like that, and subscribe to the newsletter and get the news before everybody else, you go to relichunters.com.br. That's great. Mark, thank you very much for coming here. There is anything else you'd like to say to the audience? Uh, just if there are any uh, Kickstarter backers and founders there, just thank you very much for bringing us to this moment uh, that we are right now like every single year making this game has been a struggle but a good type of struggle i think we've been happy and working on our dream game every single year and in every year we have been facing challenges like how we're gonna pay for this year right how are we gonna do this how, <laughs> how, how are we gonna go through this? right yeah how are we gonna approach these massive problems and throughout all of this journey um, our founders and our backers have always been so supportive and just it's highly motivated to, and highly validating that you eventually going to get somewhere when you have people like cheering for you and giving you feedback and supporting you every step of the way is just amazing. So yeah, this is, always, this is something that I'm always going to be grateful for, for sure. Thanks a lot, Mark. Thank you. Yeah, it was a pleasure. See you, man. Okay, so I hope you all enjoy. That was an amazing Player 2 episode. This game was really, really nice. I love it. I love the references. I love the way the game is built. And Mark was a very, very, very talented guy, very experienced. I hope you all enjoy. You can see a list, a full list of other Player 2 here, right? Right here on the cards that will appear here, so don't miss it. And see you soon, folks. Bye-bye.